My name is Banvir, and uh, this is my very first time at a BMJ IHI uh, conference speaking in public, and it's a great honor and privilege to do that. And doubly now that I've just been introduced by Fiona herself. Well, that's fantastic. Um, I was very nervous to get up here, and I just had the best piece of advice by uh, Jason Leach, who just looked at me and said, it's an open mic, don't swear. Thank you for that. Now, in this opening keynote this morning, you will hear different perspectives on mindset. A junior and a senior doctor will reflect on their shared experience of giving and receiving feedback after a breakdown in communication on a busy night. Now, so many of you here today can relate to this, I'm sure. Now, referencing the pioneering work of Carol Dweck, Anne Bettenberg will reflect on both these events and show how this shift from a fixed mindset to a growth mindset is an essential part of developing quality improvement within an organization. Now, after the session, you will be asked to use these great perspectives to consider your own mindset and what changes you can make and the impact this will have on, your, on improving outcomes for your patients. Uh, that being said, a little bit of an intro, introduction on myself. Uh, my name is Manvir, and I come from Malaysia. We're a country of 32 million people. Our healthcare system is uh, pretty, pretty good. 95% um, of our population has access to a healthcare facility within five kilometers of wherever they are. Now, um, in 2013, my story actually begins uh, 10 years before that, but in 2013, after a successful kidney transplant, after a year after that, I hit a bit of a wall and uh, my level started to go haywire. Now, after several tests and a couple of biopsies, no conclusive data was obtained. And uh, my doctors, the entire team of them, sat me down and told me that even though they've been doing kidney transplants since 1978, they'd never come across this situation before. They actually were extremely vulnerable and told me that they think I should be referred to another country because they were the, the top specialist center in the country. And they actually sat right in front of me with their hands, just like this, the entire team of them. And you could feel the emotion because they were absolutely honest. They were absolutely vulnerable with me. And uh, my wife and my, uh, I, my wife is uh, my donor, uh, we were really taken aback by that. And, and we sat down there, we thought about it, and we said, no, Doc, uh, we believe in what you guys are doing. We're going to give this a couple of more days. Uh, and to see if the current treatments of Timo, Globulin, and a whole host of other uh, fancy names were, were, were pumped into me. And it was then actually, that I made that decision really to be an integral part of my own health and participate in it fully. Now, I have since that time been, uh, become healthier and fitter by design, and this has led to a higher awareness of all things that can either help or damage my health. Uh, a subsequent result of that has also been the fact that I actually save my healthcare provider about 400 euro every month on my medication and my, my facilities because I don't have to go there. Uh, and it actually saves them a lot of time caring for me because I'm actually doing that on my own. Now, this experience showed me how I was able to move from a fixed mindset uh, where I thought I'm ill and my well-being is dependent on external factors, which is actually doctors and, and uh, medical science. And there's not much I can do to contribute to that. And I moved from that fixed mindset and developed a growth mindset where my current situation is not set in stone. And let's find out what influence I can have on it. So I've had a positive effect from that. Uh, there have been peaks and valleys, of course. 
uh, but the entire group of my, my support network, which is the doctors and the nurses, have been extremely supportive as well. And we see that the entire uh, bunch of our patients have actually moved forward as well, and with this positive influence. Now, our next speaker is up here, someone that you guys know. I've just met him yesterday. I'm already impressed by the integrity that he carries and the intelligence. It's, it's, it's fantastic. And he's going to share with you his thought process on this as well. Uh, can I invite up on stage Ian Lestikov? Thank you, Manvir. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for sharing your story. Um, well, good morning again. Um, let me get the zapper. Um, thank you, Manvir, for, for, for setting the scene and sharing your, your personal story with us. Um, from that story, I want to step back a little bit and then go forward again. So I want to step back to safety in a broader sense. Uh, because it's very interesting, if you look at the development of safety in different sectors, you see a very similar form of development. If I can have the first slide, please. Um, this is a slide that I'll show you. It's from uh, the uh, Hearts and Minds program of Shell, the oil company. Is it up there? No. I had to press after the first slide. <laughs> It's okay, but, but thank you for giving me the feedback. It's, I can grow from this. Um, uh, what you see here is a, is a slide that was made in the Hearts and Minds program of Shell, uh, the oil company, about 10, 15, 20 years ago. And you can see a development of safety. So first, if you look at safety improvement, first we look at technology and standards. We improve the technology and the knowledge that we have. And, and then it kind of hits a flat. And to improve further, we have to look at how to handle this technology and handle this knowledge. So then you get into management systems and, um, and protocols and stuff like that. And then it also hits a flat. And then if you want to improve further, then you have to look at things like culture and behavior. I'll give you an, a concrete example. In, in, in uh, um, car, car accidents, traffic safety. So first we designed automobiles that kept driving that didn't fall apart, and we made roads that were, that were, that were safe to drive on. And then as uh, the, the development of uh, techni technical development progressed, it became more and more complex to understand these vehicles. So we made dashboards, uh, and we introduced driving licenses. So we had to train people, we had to give them a way to understand the technology that they're using. And now, the weakest link of safety, at least in our country, uh, with regard to traffic safety is behavior. So we have campaigns like this one saying onderweg offline, which means if you're on the road, you have to be offline. So not look at your, your, your uh, smartphone while you're driving. In 2016, 50% of the major traffic accidents in the Netherlands were caused by either alcohol and driving or speeding. Alcohol or speeding, these are both behaviors, these are both choices made by the drivers. So, and we see the same in healthcare if you look at the development. First, the, the previous 100, 200 years, we have had tremendous improvements in technology. We are doing things that were inconceivable 50 years ago. But this technology is also becoming more and more complex for us to understand, so we are making guidelines. And we're making protocols, how to handle the technology, how to handle the knowledge that we have, how to make sure that our patients in varying circumstances can receive the same level of care. And at least in our country, we're kind of hitting a, 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 a wall in this, that more protocols and more uh, uh, guidelines will not create the next level of safety. The next level of safety needs another mindset, needs like a behavior, we have to talk about uh, uh, our behavior, and we have to discuss uh, culture with each other, and that is very difficult. Discussing behavior is very difficult. I'll give you a concrete example. So, um, what we do is we confuse behavior with character. So some of you 
many of you have never seen me before, and you may have, have an opinion about me. Uh, and, and some of you might have a negative opinion about me. Some of you might think, think well, he's arrogant because he's standing there. Uh, if you think that, if you think that, then you'll probably think he is arrogant and not he is behaving arrogantly in this setting. Because that's what we do. We see behavior and we say he or she is, he is lazy. She is always too late. Uh, that's what we do, and that makes it very difficult to discuss these things because people feel attacked on their character. And, of course, you can get attacked back because everybody has their flaws. In healthcare, it's even more difficult because here we have what's called the hidden curriculum, which says that healthcare professionals have to be infallible. If you can't stand the heat, stay out of the kitchen. If you make a mistake, you made a stupid mistake, it's your fault. You have to be infallible because you can't let the patients down. And this, of course, is ridiculous because we're not infallible. So the only, or one of the ways to get out of this is to actually discuss this and be open about things that could be better to open up uh, the conversation and give feedback. For example, if you think somebody should be pushing a button, just say it and don't wait <laughs> until 3,000 people get bored because the slide's not coming up. So thank you for that. Um, you have to thank people when they do that so they have a low threshold of, of giving you feedback the next time. Um, and by coincidence, I came upon this, this very inspirational story of two doctors who both in their own way uh, did this. And I'm, 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 I'm very glad that they were uh, brave enough to come here today. And, and Manvir, I'm going to give the, the stage back to you so you can introduce them. Thank you so much, Ian. It's just a, a little bit of a snapshot of what we're going to be discussing. And like we promised earlier, we've got um, shared experience. And this is something I, I believe that many, many of you here will be able to relate to. And so without further ado, let's get them up and hear the story. Um, can we invite up on stage Dr. Andy Parker, who is the junior pediatrician and fellow pediatric uh, hematologist. Come up, please. And also Professor Wim Helbing. Give it up for them, please. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm OK. Thanks for the introduction. Well, good morning. Thank you for being here. It's extremely uh, difficult to discuss this, but you know we have to because these are, these are things that really happen and difficult things make us move forward. Um, so, Anne, can you tell us in your own words what really happened? What happened? Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm trying to explain what happened. It's several years ago, so it's uh, back in the memory. <laughs> But um, at that time, I was a junior, just started at the an academic hospital at the Department of Neonatal Intensive Care. And together with my supervising neonatologist, I was responsible for approximately 24 very sick neonates. And it was a night shift at midwinter time. Of course, I was nervous at the start. And um, there was one particular baby, very sick, dealing with multiple complex problems. And at daytime, all doctors involved discussed about treatment options. And one of those problems was a congenital heart disease. And they discussed the options for treatment and unfortunately they concluded there was no treatment option for this neonate for his heart disease and they decided to, um, uh, to quit treatment. <clears throat> For the other problems, he was on the uh, neonatal intensive care unit. Okay. And at night time, the parameters of the patient changed. For example, the oxygen level increased, and we were discussing what to do, continue with the policy which was decided the day before, or change it because of change in parameters. And my supervisor asked me to call the cardiologist on call. And being on call means 
the cardiologist can sleep at home but has to be in the hospital within a couple of minutes. So I called Professor Helbing in the middle of the night and explained what happened at night time. And very quickly the conversation changed. He raised his voice and he said to me, why are you calling me now? We already made decision about this, hadn't we? And now you got me irritated. Um, <laughs> he got frustrated and due to the raised voice, the nurses on the ward could hear the phone call and they signed to me, would you like me to call your supervisor? So I said, yes, please. <laughs> he was at uh, another ward busy with another patient. And I handed over the phone and together they quickly decided what to do. And the patient was never at risk in this case because they decided the plan to treat the patient. But as you probably can all understand, I was shaken by this phone call. And after my night shift, I decided to contact Professor Helbink about this to evaluate the phone call. The next day? The next morning, yes. So I was very tired and I can still remember I was sitting there in a green chair in his room and he quit his administrative work in the morning. And I asked him what can we do differently because it would be hard or I couldn't, I did not dare to call him again in the other night shifts and that would affect my patient care of course. So I had to go there to discuss this. And he treated me with mutual respect and we had a very constructive conversation and he agreed to um, that his reaction was very frustrated and he would do differently in next time. And I felt so relieved when I left. I can still see myself biking home and I thought, whoa, this was really impressive. Yeah. And the way, the respect and the constructive way we discussed this and talked about busy night shifts and difficulties in decision making in healthcare um, was really ins inspired me a lot. And now he's a role model how he uh, handled this for me. So it was a long time ago, but impressive for me, and I hope that it will inspire others. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that, that story. Um, professor. <clears throat> well, you can see how, how appreciative they are of, of your story and your bravery this morning. Um, professor, can you share with us the other side of the phone call and, and you know, the thought processes that went through? Uh, before and after the phone call. Well, I think we agree it was a busy night. Okay. And I'd be, it was a, a, an on call uh, that had been busy the evening before, so I was in bed. Uh, I think I'd been asleep for an hour or so. And then Anne called, and um, uh, well, the way she presented the question, the time of the night, the problem we thought we had solved, all this helped me to, well, to get perhaps, you should say frustrated, perhaps you should say angry. And that was uh, probably perspiring in the way I connected to you. Um, so you did the right thing. You called your supervisor and, uh, well, we've solved the problem in a few minutes. Um, the next morning I thought, well, this is not, I wasn't proud of myself. I wasn't very happy about my reaction myself. So actually I was quite happy that Anne came forward and that she, um, well, actually the way she did this was the perfect example of how you provide feedback. She didn't blame me. She didn't uh, argue about well, what actually had happened. She just said, okay, well, this, uh, this happened to me. I didn't think this was right. I've, I didn't feel good about it. And how do we avoid this the next time? And I think that put me in a position to, to, to get feedback in a proper way, but also to reflect on my own role and discuss with them, okay, what actually happens, regardless of the differences in our position in the organization. And I think that's the way uh, it should be. It, it was, for me, it was a, a warning sign. Okay. Um, so I was very glad that Dan did this, and it made me reflect on my role, on the things that happen on a ward like this during the night. This wasn't the first time this happened 
with me or with one of my colleagues. I've had uh, signs of things like this going on with other colleagues. And it's very easy in a situation like that to say, okay, well, blame the other guy, don't talk about it, give him an angry look, and, well, find support with your colleagues, and then we start gossiping, and nothing has changed. And did something completely different, and I think she was very right in doing so. So are you saying that uh, the situation where a junior doctor had and never come up to you prior to this to, to have a discussion. I, I have been a professor in a university hospital for more than 10 years, leading one of the largest departments in the university children's hospital. I never get any feedback. <laughs> well, and what did this whole experience do for you? Uh, at that time, it inspired me to speak up if there are problems. Okay. Because of the respectful way I was treated. And um, uh, uh, reflecting on it, I think it's important to find the right momentum or to create the right momentum to okay. speak up. If I wait three months, the moment would have been gone already. And next, I think it's important to find a shared perspective. Um, it's hard to speak up for yourself, but sometimes it's easier to speak up for others, for example, your patients. And um, in our case, improving patient care was our shared perspective. We both wanted the best patient care we could give. So taking that as a... As a uh, perspective we could have a, a constructive conversation and I think that's important and from there on I shared this uh, story at that time with my colleagues with my fellow registers to hopefully inspire them to speak up in case of problems and now we're here several years later I was suddenly called by the inspector of healthcare from the Netherlands and for a doctor, that's a really scary phone call. <laughs> ah. <laughs> so that brings us to you, Ian. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm yep. sure as the inspector of health in the Netherlands, you've heard thousands of stories. Uh, what made this different? Why did you actually call them, seek them out, finding out more? What, what, what started that? Oh, it was a, a, a coincidental... Um, um, uh, combination of factors. So at, at that time I was having discussions with our Inspector General about the, the potential of this mindset theory that we're going to hear about uh, for improving healthcare. And uh, we, were, we were talking about this and then uh, a surgical a friend of mine uh, told me this story. Um, and I was very struck by it. Uh, it, it touched me. I thought, well, uh, th this is really an inspirational story from both sides from the side of the junior doctor speaking up and the side of the senior doctor accepting this and using it to, to improve himself. And, um, and I thought, I, 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 I want to get that story out there. <laughs> okay. uh, but I did realize, of course, that it's a bit difficult as a, a healthcare inspector to call somebody and say, I know something about you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> because usually those phone calls uh, <laughs> go a little bit differently. I agree with you about that. Uh, um, so I, I, I was in doubt, but I thought I, I'm doing it anyway because it, this can inspire so many people. Uh, um, so I hope uh, I did the right thing, but uh, we'll see. But that, that, that's why I uh, chose to bring the story to the light. Well, I think a couple of points to remember from, for me as a patient is I thank the both of you for doing what you did immediately. You didn't wait a week or a month where you forgot. It was a little shady. You've seen 50 other patients or 100 other patients. You did it immediately the next morning. It's fresh in your mind. The emotion is fresh in your mind. Uh, whatever, the hurt is there. And you, get, you manage to, to use that and propel yourself to positive discussion. That's, that's, that's absolutely fantastic. Now, uh, Professor, for you, who's never heard feedback before this, and I'm sure after this, this 3,500 people here, you're going to get some feedback as well. It must have been uh, a bit uncomfortable for you to share this, was it? Definitely, yeah. Okay. 
actually we, uh, we considered should we do this? Um, so what if we make the headlines of the evening news tonight? <laughs> what, what will happen? We, we really didn't know and well, uh, we didn't know this forum, it's my mistake, but uh, we didn't know this forum, we didn't know what the reactions would be. So we discussed, um, I went to the head of my department uh, telling this story and asking him for advice. Um, he, uh, he went to the board of directors, we went to the uh, public relations department of our, uh, of our, uh, of our institute, <laughs> we went to the lawyers, um, but, <laughs> but I think the most important reaction came from the patients and, uh, and you, you discussed with the patients, can you, perhaps you can tell what, what they said. We, we asked a patient and a couple of parents of patients from this department how would they advise us in uh, telling this story. And all of them reported back, we are moved by this story and please share it because um, we see this happening all the time, sitting next to our child, seeing a lot of specialists coming, discussing with each other, not always in a very effective way. So please share it and hopefully it will inspire others to speak up and maybe we can make the environment more safe that it will be normal to present incidents like this on, in this. In this kind of a forum, that's yes. great. Uh, Ian, your thoughts on, I mean, uh, now that it's happened and, and you know, uh, we're sharing the story, what do you see, what's your aspiration from, from, from this? <clears throat> well, f f for me, hearing, I've heard it a couple of times because we, we've, we've practiced <laughs> naturally, but it, it still touches me, it really does. Uh, um, and what, what I hope is, well, what Anna, Anna says, that, that the juniors out, out, out in, in, in the hall and also the ones watching us on the live stream will uh, gather their strength and their bravery to speak up. But also that the senior doctors and the, and the managers and the people who, maybe everybody can think about when's the last time somebody gave me feedback? And, um, and what can I do to lower the barriers of the people around me to give me feedback because I need feedback to be able to become and to stay the person that I want to be. Uh, so that would be my main message, yes. Okay. Uh, thank you. And um, currently uh, on top of whatever you're doing in work, you're also speaking and you're trying to get this message out. How do you see that, the response from, from other doctors and colleagues? Uh, for, for us, uh, at the first time we said, do we really have to present this? Shouldn't it be normal? <laughs> but um, eventually it isn't, <laughs> so it's important, I think, to share. And I think for juniors, we're not trained to do this. We're not trained how to react on incidents or a communication breakdown, what, what to do. And it would be, I think it would be really helpful to implement this, for example, in the curriculum that the, the system is more safe to do this, but the, the persons, the healthcare workers, are trained to receive and give feedback in a proper way. Okay, Professor, your, your last thoughts on this? Uh, well, um, there were several thoughts that crossed my mind when you asked this question to Anne. Um, perhaps the most sobering response I got was from my wife, and she's a, a, a manager uh, of large groups of professionals in an international IT firm. Um, and she said, are you really going to present this? This is just normal behavior, so what's the, what's the message? <laughs> um, my colleagues, uh, particularly my peers from within the institutional said, are you really going to present this? That's very courageous. <laughs> my colleagues from within pediatric cardiolo cardiology just, well, they shrugged their shoulders and they said, well, okay, go ahead. And I think that's the result of what happened after this incident. Um, to myself and to my group, I thought, well, okay, let, what, what, what signal is and conveying, is it, what's she telling about me? So I, th I gave that some reflection, I started thinking about myself, I tackled some personal issues, 
I also looked at why am I behaving like this in an organization that I'm working in. So I tackled some organizational issues. And since I knew that this happened before with colleagues of mine, I thought, okay, what can I do within my own group? And started to realize that all the discussions we have are about content. They are about how do we treat patients? What type of science do we do? What teaching program do we need to develop? But we never talk about, okay, how do we relate to each other? How do we re respond to each other? How do we give, give feedback? And that, of course, has implications for the way we feel ourselves, but also probably for the way we treat our patients. And fortunately, the institution I'm in provided, uh, provides help for groups that really want to improve themselves. And we have a professional coach that helps us to interact to improve team interaction so several times a year we sit we sit uh, with the entire team we close the doors we don't discuss content but we just discuss okay how are we doing in our group what can we what can we improve in communication how do we relate to, relate to each other do we provide feedback in a proper way and i think that's uh, that has been extremely helpful for us and i don't know if this if there's any uh, relationship to that, but since then we have uh, almost doubled our catchment area. We have almost doubled the number of pediatric cardiologists. We have required a lot of additional staff from support from our board of directors in our institution. So if that's the re result of all uh, what happened since and stepped into my room, I think that has been very successful. Thank you for that. Thank you. And on behalf of all patients, future and past, I mean, thank you for doing what you guys are doing. And thank you for starting this ball rolling, you know, by, by making that all important phone call. Yep. So calls that come from the inspector of health are usually can be good, <laughs> can be good as well. Thank you. And uh, if you'd like to talk a little bit more about this, uh, you can use this hashtag quality 2018 as well. Um, our next speaker up to talk a little bit more about these shared experiences uh, is a clinical associate professor from the Southern Methodist University in the US of A, uh, Ms. Anne Bettenberg. Thank you. Well done, that really went well. <laughs> Hi everyone. Uh, good morning, I'm Anne. I'm actually from an area, uh, I'm noticing all of the parallels. I'm a teacher educator. And just like you doctors who take your patients home with you, teachers take their students home with them all year. Uh, there's a great deal of teacher burnout, like there's a great deal of uh, doctor burnout. So I think that I, my hope from this is that you use mindset as sort of a gateway strategy, like marijuana is a gateway drug, uh, that you use this as a, a beginning, a baseline, to seek out other strategies in terms of wellness for yourselves. Um, this situation went about as well as I can imagine it going. How many of you can imagine a pair of people in your own uh, workplaces where this situation would have gone quite differently? Yes, some nervous laughter, yes. Um, so what I'm gonna tell you a little bit about is uh, uh, the general intro to mindset, kind of a drive-by <laughs> intro in 20 minutes. Uh, and I'm hoping that we can spot the qualities that made this interaction more positive so you could replicate those in your uh, context. Um, so three things, first of all, what are the mindsets? The behaviors then that flow from those mindsets and then I'm gonna give you some concrete strategies so you can develop a growth mindset yourself. Um, so first, what are these mindsets? What is this, what are we talking about? So it comes down to what you believe. A fixed mindset person believes that intelligence and every other quality you possess is fixed, stable, and uncontrollable. You're pretty much born with what you got and that's all you have to deal with your whole life. A growth mindset person believes that intelligence and other qualities are changeable, unstable, and very controllable. Um, I have some two examples from my own life in the self-disclosure mode we are in. Um, when I first read Mindset, my first memory I had, I flashed as myself as a sixth grader, um, about 11 years old. Uh, my teacher had put up one of those uh, charts on the wall with all the kids' names in the class going across, all the weeks of the school year going uh, across, and if you got 100% on your spelling test, you got a star in the box. Well, I immediately decide I'm getting all stars. It's not about playing with words or learning spelling or improving, it is about getting those stars. Well, halfway through the year, uh, my teacher started giving pretests 
for spelling. And if you did well enough on the pretest, you got a harder list. So I immediately start getting enough wrong on the pretest where I can keep the easier list. Yes, because it's about the stars, people. It's about the stars, okay? I think this is typical behavior in high achievers. Might be typical behavior. Um, in my day job at SMU, I am a teacher educator. My area is gifted education, so I study smart people for a living. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go, but, but mindset is particularly important uh, to smart people. Uh, one study in gifted education was done uh, where 50% of the sample had, had, were hardcore fixed mindsets, where only 5% we're growth mindsetted. So this is, this is an, uh, I don't know if this is true for you guys uh, all over the place, but in America, very smart children uh, do not get challenged in school very much. They're kept with age peers and not necessarily challenged, so they realize quite quickly that things are easy for them. They don't have to work very hard to get grades and good grades, and then at some point, the realization that things aren't easy turns into an expectation that things aren't easy that I can get good grades, I can do well, I don't need feedback, uh, I should be perfect without much effort. And so uh, that kind of getting all stars thing goes throughout our lives. Um, fast forward 30 years, I start playing tennis. Uh, last racket I held was made of wood, so I get my swanky new lightweight racket with a head about this big. And I am not six seconds on the court, and I'm like, you give me five or six years, Wimbledon. <laughs> Which on one hand is incredibly growth mindsetted, right? Just unrealistically, absurdly growth mindsetted. But on the other hand, it's the same kind of I'm gonna get all stars sort of an attitude, that I'm gonna be hyper achieving in even this. And so, Thankfully, I had been working with mindset for several years at that point, and so I could reframe to some more realistic goals, like, you know, moving this middle-aged body, making some friends, finding a forehand before we're planning on playing Serena on the senior tour. <laughs> so anyway, so the, the key to this, this mindset, the growth mindset, is this belief you have in your head, the belief that your basic qualities are things you can cultivate through your efforts, your strategies, and help from others. And it's this belief that actually leads to different behaviors. So, um, so I'm not sure if Anne believed that, that Vim could change, but she had patient safety in mind, so she just didn't care. She moved forward. But Vim clearly believed that he could change and worked for many months on what he could change. But people before either were too afraid or believed him to be, um, like Ian said, believed him to be just arrogant or, or not able to change. So it's our beliefs about each other and ourselves that allow us to have these different patterns of behavior. Um, a person with a fixed mindset would behave very, very differently than these two did. Um, so what are these behaviors? Um, this idea that beliefs affect behavior uh, exists across the literature. There was a study done of uh, older language learners. The greatest obstacle to older adult language learning is the doubt in the minds of both the learner and the teacher that older adults can learn a new language. Actually, older adults are better at learning language than young kids. They learn it fast, learn languages faster, and more completely, more deeply than little kids do. But there is this belief that they can't, and that stops many people from even trying. Um, so I'm going to run through just a series of, of behaviors um, that have been borne out in the research about the differences between fixed and growth mindsets. Um, first of all, the goals for learning are very different. Fixed mindsets, they're not even actually there to learn, they're there to perform. They're there to look good, they're get the good grades, be the best, look smart. It's a performance goal, it's not a learning goal. So they're always looking to demonstrate their ability to others. Whereas a growth mindseted person really wants to improve, no matter how foolish they look, um, they're always seeking challenge and to grow. Now, I'm not interested in anyone taking video of me on the tennis court, but I am very, very growth in tennis. You throw that fuzzy yellow ball and I am after it, no problem. Um, and I, but I am fixed in other areas still. So I don't want you to think this is like an on-off switch. So first of all, you can be fixed in some areas, growth in others, and it largely depends on your interest or your passion for the topic, whether or not your growth. And it's also kind of a sliding scale, so you can be super, super fixed um, or just a little bit fixed. So keep that in mind. 
Um, if you're in a learning mode as a growth mindset, or you believe effort is a positive thing, um, things are often difficult when you begin to learn something new and mistakes are normal. Um, a fixed mindset person sees effort as negative. Things should be easy and effortless. If it's not easy, it's just not my thing. And this again is learned behaviors. Looking at little children, um, as I have done uh, in my professional career, these are behaviors that, that teachers and parents have praised into existence. It's our feedback, it's the messages they get from society that teaches us to be this way. So if you spot yourself in these slides, in these descriptions of behavior, I want you to forgive yourself. Th these are learned behaviors, so you can learn a different way to be. I'm trying new things. Uh, fixed mindset individuals think challenges and risks are threatening. They should be avoided. They quit things very easily. Um, they feel helpless in the face of setbacks. They might cheat um, as an option. And think about it, if you don't do well in something, but you think you're fixed, what other options do you have really to do well other than to cheat? So it's, it's just a logical kind of thing. Um, I shouldn't be talking to you today uh, I was, I had dreams of being a marine biologist and sailing the seven seas and talking to dolphins when I was a freshman in college and then I took chemistry 210 and it didn't go well. Uh, <laughs> and because, so, so the fixed mindset, there's two reactions when you hit that setback. One is an emotional setback, like, oh, I'm, this is just my thing, I'm not smart anymore. I've run out of whatever I had, I don't have it here, and I don't have any more of it. Um, but there's also a very practical consideration um, that I didn't, since I hadn't been challenged uh, up until that point, I didn't have the strategies to actually work out how to work hard. Um, I have a lovely special position at, at the university where I work, where I actually live in the residence halls with the students. They've asked me to do this. It's a, a thing they call the faculty in residence for a residential commons model. So I have events for students every week. And after midterms, one of the students came into one of my talks and uh, got the first B he had ever gotten in his whole life as a freshman. And he said, okay, they told me college was hard and I, I need to buckle down and work harder. Note cards, you people have been talking about note cards for years, what do you do with them? He literally had no strategies for working hard because he had never been challenged. So both emotionally as well as practically, when you run into a, a difficulty, you, you have some issues. Whereas in trying new things, growth minded said people are always trying new things. Challenges are fun and actively sought. They persevere in the face of difficulty. They feel powerful in response to setbacks. They seek help. I think you can really see Aunt Anna's behavior here. Um, a fixed mindset person wouldn't have taken that risk to begin with. Um, response to criticism, this is where we see Vim a fixed mindset individual would get very defensive. Um, high achieving people uh, connect their performance to their self-worth. And so if you're giving them feedback, you are inherently downgrading them as a, as a human. Um, criticism is a reflection of the fixed traits and worth of a person. Whereas a growth mindset individual takes criticism as a learning opportunity. They're focused on improving the skill it's not a reflection of themselves at all. And so you can see that, that in Wim's, Wim's example that that's, that's actually what um, he was doing. Um, there was a very uh, interesting study done. Uh, other people's successes, fixed mindset individuals, whenever somebody else succeeds, it's their failure. If you're constantly out to be number one, then if somebody else does well, that means you're not doing as well as them because you're constantly comparing yourself to other people. Whereas growth mindset people um, find other successes as inspiring and something to be celebrated and learned from. Wrongdoing, Ian, Ian touched on this. Um, we confuse these attributes or skills with who we are. So it turns out if you have fixed minds, a fixed mindset, you have fixed ideas about yourself, you also have fixed ideas about other people. You're, you're more uh, likely to succumb to stereotypes. Uh, so they, uh, somebody is arrogant, they are a cheater, they are a bully. Um, and the only response to someone who has those qualities like a bully is to retaliate against them, uh, to punish them. Uh, there isn't any positive outcome, whereas somebody with a growth mindset attributes some wrongdoing to situational factors, to motivation, and their response uh, is to educate, compromise, and to be more forgiving. Um, 
So you get kind of a picture here of what the two mindsets are. And I don't know about you, being a recovering fixed mindsetter myself, it's highly stressful being in this blue, blue area. So when I read this book, I was like, oh, thank God, there is another way to be in the world. And why didn't anybody tell me about this sooner, you know? So depending on who is in your uh, office, your, your workplace, this could be quite an adaptive workplace, like Vim discussed uh, after they, they talked about this feedback system. It's actually a mutually supportive environment. It's highly adaptive and effective. If you have a lot of fixed mindsetters running around, this could be quite toxic. Um, so the good news is, is there is a choice. And now that you know about this, you have a choice. I'm gonna give you some strategies. If you would like to move <laughs> into a, a growth mindset, then here are some steps to take. I've taken them myself, um, and I know that they work, all right? So here are six strategies for you. Growing a growth mindset, befriending the fixed, normalizing struggle, cultivating awareness of your inner voice, learn about it, love mistakes. You're not gonna love mistakes, but I'm just saying, what's a goal? Um, and then creating feedback systems. So first of all, a caveat, uh, a growth mindset is not like a dog at the pound. You do not adopt one, you grow it. It's hard and it takes a long time. <laughs> um, but, so just keep that, keep, people with a fixed mindset and learn about this and are super excited about it, like, oh my God, thank God, there's another way of being in the world. Tomorrow, all growth, all right? <laughs> So, so you will use your, your hyper-achieving fixed mindset self to adopt that growth mindset and it doesn't work that way. Uh, so uh, befriending the fix, the best question I ever got for, about this was from a little tiny 10-year-old boy at one of the middle schools where I presented this. And he said, what do I do with my fixed mindset while I'm growing a growth mindset? <laughs> like, yeah, that's it, sweetheart. That is exactly it. So. Uh, so the idea is to befriend it. First of all, if you have a fixed mindset and you're in this room, you are a highly successful individual. Your fixed mindset helped you get that way. So it is not a bad thing, it is not wrong. It is just a different way of being in the world um, that may or may not be adaptive for you. And so Carol Dweck has this wonderful strategy where she named her fixed mindset, she calls, uh, calls it Maurice. And so whenever she is aware of these, these uh, fixed mindset behaviors arising, she just you know, shakes her head and says, oh, there's Maurice again. Um, <laughs> and that's actually, a, I think, a cognitive behavioral therapy strategy to kind of distance yourself. You name your past self as an acknowledgement of who you don't want to be anymore. You're affecting change. Uh, the other thing is to forgive it. Again, this is not your fault. These are learned behaviors. Um, all the adults in your life with the best of intentions actually created this in you, um, and you were just responding to your environment. So please do not, do not beat yourself up. Do not use this as another source of be beating yourself up. Um, so befriending the fixed. Um, expecting struggle, normalizing struggle is, is I think a really, really important uh, strategy, okay? Um, they have found in college studies of college students, if you just normalize that college is hard, um, graduation rates in certain groups go up by 50%. Um, it's the idea that, again, your, your beliefs turn into thoughts, turn into behaviors. So if you see everybody else and you think they're not struggling and you're struggling, you think, oh, I don't belong here. And if you think you don't belong here, then you're gonna drop classes more often. You're not gonna continue. And so, this is hard work. Um, the giving and receiving of feedback is, is not easy on either side, right? Anna was terrified, absolutely terrified. Her job could have been at stake. How many years had she worked? And she had this one uncomfortable interaction and she is brave enough to confront this, right? But it could have cost her. So it's, that's terrifying on one side. And then for Vim, this could be a completely ego-busting experience, right? Someone who isn't used to getting feedback is now suddenly getting it, and from a junior, what the heck, right? So, um, so it's, it's, it's difficult. So expect it to be hard. Do not expect to be perfect at this um, at the beginning. Um, really pay attention to your inner voice. Uh, there are all kinds of meditation apps out there 
these, these beliefs that you have are knocking around in your head, and if you are not aware of them, then you can't talk yourself out of it. So if you've named your fixed mindset self, you can talk to it. If you understand what it's saying to you, you can argue with it. And so how many of you have an inner voice, an inner critic that is meaner to you than any other human being has ever been, right? I don't know where it comes from. I honestly do not know where it comes from. Nobody spoke, has ever spoken to me the way my, I speak to myself inside my head. And so if you're not aware of those thoughts, then you can't argue with them. So definitely uh, notice your inner voice, uh, particularly notice your inner voice when you screw up. Uh, in response to setbacks and mistakes, do you uh, react with despair or do you react with curiosity? All right. I, I almost guarantee that no one in your life, when you had a bad day, greeted you at the door and said, oh great, you had a bad day. Let's get some hot chocolate and talk about it. You can tell me everything you've learned from all the mistakes you made. Nobody, nobody does that. And it turns out studies have shown that parents who treat mistakes as enhancing tend to develop growth mindset children, and parents who view mistakes as debilitating tend to create fixed mindset people. So think back on your childhood. Um, think back on how people reacted when you made a mistake. Um, these, these go really deep. Uh, I was giving this present, a version of this presentation to a group of preschool teachers. So these teachers were already seeing these fixed and growth mindset patterns develop in three and four year olds. And one of the teachers told a story about uh, a little boy who was reluctant to write, uh, was waiting for his mom to pick him up, spontaneously drew, the, drew a picture for the teacher, um, beamed as he showed her the, the, the drawing, and she asked him some good questions about it and said, well, you're the artist, you have to sign it. And he wrote out his name, and at that moment, the mom came in to pick him up, and mom said, hey, like, you know, we've been trying to get your kid to, you know, work on these fine motor skills and trying to draw this picture, and uh, showed the picture to the mom, and the mom said, you, you spelled your name wrong. Yeah, crushing. Um, so I think all of us have those kinds of experiences where they just, they just go really far back and, and really deep. So these, again, are learned behaviors. We have a long history of baggage around mistakes. Now, in, in the field of medicine, obviously, your mistakes can be catastrophic. Uh, when you're dealing with your patient's life, life, you know, it's life and death situation. So in terms of culture, it isn't a life and death situation. You can be more forgiving for each other. You can share this burden. You don't have to carry it yourself. Um, so de developing these systems are, are going to be really good. I think there's actually a, one of the sessions tonight at the Night Forum is about mistakes, so I'll be interested to, to hear that. Um, the last strategy is uh, creating feedback systems. Um, Working together, the, the next session after this is about the design cycle. So you're gonna create systems, they're not gonna be perfect. You get feedback on those systems and then you make improvements. Um, it is essential that the most powerful people participate uh, in these uh, feedback systems to, as showing an example as they are part of it because otherwise junior people are just gonna be too afraid to, to do it. So hopefully you've taken away a basic definition of what the mindsets are, the behaviors that flow from those mindsets, and the strategies that you can use to grow a growth mindset. I just wanna leave you with this thought that beliefs do matter, that what you tell yourself a thousand times every day is creating circuits in your mind that is going to lead you to behave in a different way. I hope that learning about this gives you another choice. So choose growth. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. That was very, very inspirational. And um, uh, what, what, what we really hope is that, that, it, uh, that this talk can help you the coming two days to look at the presentations and the posters and, 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 and when you hear the stories of other people and, and look at those through a growth mindset. Look at them not in a way like uh, that this can't be done in my region or can't be done in my organization or can't be done in my country because of whatever. But think, well, this is interesting. How, 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 could I, how could I 
uh, go, how could I take what I'm learning here and, and try to tweak it so that it can be done in my situation, in my um, country, etc. So that's why we are sending out this uh, growth message to you at the beginning of the forum. Now the funny thing is, um, by accident, or not really by accident, I, I came across uh, the fact that my daughter, my eight-year-old daughter, is already being taught this. So if we can have the slide. Um, this is a booklet of my daughter, Sophie. She was seven uh, uh, when she uh, started this. And, uh, and this is a booklet that shows Fixie and Growy as two comical figures explaining what they are. And they have these uh, questions uh, that, uh, that, uh, that they're asked. So the I'll, I'll translate one in, in English for you. So the top question is, when do you feel smart at school? Answer A, if I can do an assignment well without much effort and without making mistakes, or B, if I get better at it. And here you can see my daughter is uh, in, in, in the fixed mindset. Um, <laughs> So, so I will translate the second one too, just to feel a better parent. Uh, the second uh, one is, uh, what do you think uh, when you have uh, practiced something often, but it's still, it's still, you still can't do it properly? Is it A, I have the feeling that I'm learning something, or B, I'm probably not very good at it? So here, luckily, she fills in A, <laughs> or luckily. Um, of course, every answer is, is a good answer, but you see that, that it's, it's what I just learned from you. <laughs> We're all learning here today. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> and what this really gives me hope, I think, ah, isn't it great that we can teach our seven-year-olds about mindset and they go into their life with this mindset idea and just skip all the trouble that we've been having in the past <laughs> 30 years. So, uh, so with that thought, I'm going to hand over to, uh, to you again. Thank you so much, Ian. How about a big round of applause for him? Come on. Well, in a moment, I'm going to give us all a chance to move from a fixed mindset to a growth mindset, OK? Um, I'm going to ask you for a round of applause, but not yet, not yet, not yet, OK? Now, I hope you've been uh, very impacted by this session. I know, uh, actually, I have learned so much. And we'd like to thank, of course, Wim and uh, Ian and Anne, once again, how about a big round of applause for them? <laughs> now, the entire panel will be outside uh, for any Q&As at the Tea and Coffee, uh, Coffee Lounge in the exhibition area. Now, like I said, I'm going to give you an opportunity to move from a fixed mindset to a growth mindset, okay? And what we're going to do is, just like just now, there was a great round of applause. That was your fixed mindset. <laughs> now, your growth mindset will be a round of applause and stomping your feet. Not yet, but <laughs> round of applause and stomping your feet. So do move everything that's by your, by your feet, your laptops and your bags and stuff like that. And I just want to tell you that your next session is going to start at 11 o'clock. Now, before you go, I want to leave you with just one thought. And how can what we have learned here today help grow us or our organizations and, and do it to impact lives and to make them better? Uh, it's, it's great to be a part of this. And the reason I'm going to ask for a thunderous round of applause is congratulations to the organizing committee, BMJ, IHI. And I've been told for the very, very first time the plenary has ended absolutely on time. So how about that growth mindset? Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Thank you. Yay! We did it. We did it.